is that if um, if people are walking on the sidewalk, just let them get by. And you know, same thing with the road. Other than that, have a have a happy protest, and we want to keep you safe too. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Luke Sakara Flanders. Uh, I am from Freiburg, Maine. And I'll be your uh, head of ceremony for today. Um, I'm a co-founder of Community Water Justice and have been working on water rights issues in Maine uh, since I was about nine years old. Um, as a young person who has dedicated, my, as a young person who has dedicated my life to uh, working toward environmental justice, it is incredibly meaningful to see you all here standing in solidarity with future generations and people who are being impacted currently and will be impacted most by the climate crisis as it emerges. Um, today we are gathered to address the, uh, the crisis which has been largely ignored in the conversation about environmental justice, which is the crisis of the military uh, endangering human health and environmental safety for the profit of the industrial for the military industrial complex so today thank you for showing up uh, our first uh, first of all I want to say a huge thank you to the uh, the main ideal main social aid and sanctuary band for being here we're incredibly lucky to have you um, we're very very appreciative of all our organizers and speakers today I am uh, Lisa Savage. I'm from Solon, and I uh, founded the Maine Natural Guard. You can Google us and you'll get Maine National Guard first, but we are the Maine Natural Guard. And I invite everyone to take the pledge at the end of my remarks today. Uh, and that's all that's involved, really, in joining the Maine Natural Guard. But first, I want to ask a question. What do these things have in common? A cholera epidemic in Nigeria drought in California, Nevada, and other parts west, catastrophic fires in, from Lake Tahoe to Siberia, flooding in New York, New Jersey, New Orleans, China, Germany, and human trafficking in the Philippines. What do all those things have in common? They have in common that they are caused by climate crisis. They are consequences of our climate spiraling out of control and displacing people, uh, displacing people's livelihood, and making the uh, places that they live unlivable so that they then have to um, do what they can do to survive. We have been hearing scientists, climate scientists, for more than 50 years sounding the alarm about uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions and how dangerous that is to our climate as a support system for human life and other life forms 
on the planet. For many, many years, these people were minimized and poo-pooed, but we are now seeing um, you know, intergovernmental agencies like the IPCC saying, we may have passed the tipping point, folks. We may have gone beyond a heating point on the globe where we could even pull ourselves back by stop, uh, stopping the things that are really, really harming climate. So we're here to talk about, even though this level of crisis exists right now, why are we still burning jet fuel for entertainment? We are way beyond a time when people would understand that burning jet fuel is highly polluting, even more polluting than commercial jetliners. The type of fuel the military burns has a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are dangerous. And it isn't really that entertaining to continue trashing our climate while people are drowning and burning. And um, even the cold snap in Texas last winter where they lost their power grid and people died of the cold was caused by Arctic ice melting. So it really truly is a global problem and the choices that we make and the things that we do here in the U.S. have a huge impact on how the rest of the world can even survive. Um, we know that uh, air shows are primarily a recruiting tool. We'll hear more about that from our youngest speaker today. Um, the uh, Blue Angels or the Air Force Thunderbirds come to air shows to show off the military hardware and um, get young people, very young people, interested in joining the military. Um, one of the reasons that people don't understand the role of the U.S. military, which um, is a huge driver of climate change is because that information has been deliberately suppressed for many years. Uh, back in 1997, the Kyoto Protocols excluded counting military emissions. When a nation is counting up its uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the Kyoto Protocol said, don't count your military emissions. This is absurd. The uh, Earth's climate counts your military emissions, and not counting it is one of those political decisions that has huge ramifications for our health and the overall health of the planet. Then the Paris Accords in 2015 did take a little step in the right direction by making it optional to count your military emissions. Optional. So, you know, the Pentagon is the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels, and it has emissions higher than uh, 140 nations have, but we weren't, aren't going to count them because, well, if you counted them, you might read about the military's harm to climate in the New York Times or the Washington Post or on CNN or, you know, even Fox News. You might actually hear about it then. So it's better. Uh, the Pentagon thinks to just suppress that information in the first place. Um, we have the next big climate uh, gathering, international gathering coming up in Glasgow this fall in, in Scotland, and there's a strong movement uh, afoot to count military emissions and to make sure that that gets included in these agreements that nations come together to make. If you use uh, your internet search tools, you can find a couple of different petitions and letters where you can sign on and say, yes, make sure that they count military emissions this time. Um, the main Natural Guard pledge is rather simple. It is this. It is to say, I pledge that when people are talking about security in the context of military spending and weaponry, I'm going to point out that climate crisis is the biggest threat to security that exists right now for humans on the planet. And then when people are talking about climate crisis and recognizing what a threat it is, you're going to bring up that the U.S. military is a huge contributor to that problem and that the spending that they do to um, burn fossil fuels in order to invade and occupy countries in order to get more fossil fuels and so forth is uh, part of this whole equation. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Someone's honking in support. <clears throat> So I'd like to invite you to find the Maine Natural Guard on the internet and take our pledge. It's as easy as signing your name and the town you live in. And then, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your teachers, your students, your uh, grandchildren. Talk to people about the connecting of these two dots. And before I uh, yield the podium, 
I would like to invite you to do a chant with me. It goes like this. Blue angels are not green. Blue angels are not green. Blue angels are not green. Thanks everybody for being here. Back to you, Luke. Yes, sure. All right. We got. Thank you, Luke, and thank you. What a wonderful band! Incredible. I think the cars going by are enjoying the music. I want to tell a story to start. One of our friends, Gene Parker, just standing down the line here by that red sign you see. She lives in Brunswick. Bob Dale, longtime VFP member who passed away last year, her, her husband. Yesterday, you know, the Hells Angels were flying around the, the state, pumping up the jam, and they flew over Brunswick, and her sliding glass door shattered. Well, this illustrates to me the reality of what these planes do in the real world. I've been to Okinawa, I've been to various parts of Japan, I've been to South Korea, where planes like these are deployed. And I've been to the bases right in the middle of small towns, communities, even big cities, where the runways are operating 24-7, and they're making this noise all day and all night long. People tell us they can't even sleep at night three and four in the morning, the noise, the pollution, the disruption of lives, the nerves that come. And then in many places overseas, you know, these planes drop bombs and kill people. So it's no fun time for these people coming in here. They're coming for a fun time. But for people overseas, this U.S. war machine is no fun time. It's real, and it's dangerous, and it's killing the planet. So standing over here, I'm watching these cars go by, and I see a lot of kids who are willing to wave, whereas their parents are not. And so this is important to remember for us to be here because we're speaking to the next generation. We're speaking to the young people whose lives are gonna be increasingly disrupted by climate crisis and U.S. endless war and the spending for endless war. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker today is Meredith Bruskin. She has been a nurse for over 40 years and is a member of the Peace and Justice Group of Waldo County. Come on up, Meredith. I want to recognize that we are on indigenous lands and that the uh, Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples uh, always speak of the next generations. And I want to be grateful first for their stewardship for their stewardship of the land and waters of this uh, place we call Maine. I also want to recognize that they're still, thank you, <laughs> in, uh, they're still in the struggle uh, to get the state of Maine to recognize their inherent sovereignty. That sovereignty is essential to our health, all Maine people's health, because they stand for taking care of our land and waters, taking care of Mother Earth uh, in respect of both all, us and all generations. So when Lisa asked me to talk about climate and health, I thought that's easy, climate is health. The water we drink, the air we breathe, the food we eat, so essential. And when toxins and carcinogens spill into the earth and waters in the in interest of corporate profits, cancer, increases. We know plastic is choking our sea life and our oceans, 
burying islands in the South Pacific and spilling into the rivers here in Maine. That lead is poisoning our eagles and our children and carbon dioxide strangling the breath of the entire planet and stoking the cycles of droughts and floods and extreme weather that are traumatizing people around the globe. The pursuit of endless war to increase the profits of our arms, dealer, arms dealers and their investors militarize this country internally and prop up a fossil fuel economy and political system built on white supremacy has brought us to this raging time. The cost in mental and spiritual health is certainly as great as the physical cost. Our worsening addiction crisis is no surprise. PTSD is rampant from climate crisis and war, and we still are losing 18 veterans every day to suicide. So the greatest health threats are war and the existential threat of nuclear war that could be simply because of an accident due to climate crisis. I think people in Louisiana are feeling that today. Every climate catastrophe causes illness, stress that affects our immune systems, trauma, displacement, and increasingly pollutes our land and waters. We know the connection to the unequal burden of both climate change and militarism on people of color, indigenous peoples, and the poor. This pandemic gives us a clear view of the effect on health of the deep inequality in our society. We can afford health care for all our citizens. It would save us money to have a Medicare for all system. It would save thousands of lives yearly. The money spent on displays promoting the military, like the Blue Angels, could be a hefty down payment for maternal health and to support women's right to choose, let alone half of the Pentagon's budget worldwide. There were people recently in Asheville, North Carolina, standing just like us, maybe about the same number, against Raytheon moving from Hartford to North Carolina because it's cheap and it is a military state. Those 50 people stood and Steve Norris, one of the participants said, this is local resistance to a national disease. And that is exactly why we're here today. We each do whatever we can to choose health over the disease of power by wealth and the war and um, disaster economy that supports it. Despite the fire raging, we continue. That is what we do. Just like the healthcare workers who are currently risking their lives and exhausting their spirits in their work, caring for people in this pandemic, likely a virus very collected to the climate crisis. Just as indigenous and environmental activists at Line 3 and pipeline sites around the world who risked arrests and beatings, and in some cases their lives, continue, so do we. We will not let them glorify destruction in our name without speaking out. And every time we speak the truth, we shore up our immune systems and together share that strength, despite. This is a poem that I send to each of you. It's called Despite. Cold, crisp day, close to breaking, wafer thin, lifted gently from its lair between tissues of time. What was, what will be. And it will, filled with sky as translucent as breath, and just as new, these mountains shared with all their valleys and companions. Oh, the friends that walk with us along the way, rich as rain after a long dry time as a fire on a cold winter night. For this beloved, I sing my song. <laughs> this is the light that the heart carries, despite, despite. Growing up in a rural town 
and through attending public school, I was often exposed to military propaganda. From kindergarten through fifth grade, each class would have to put on a patriotic performance for the school, whether singing songs like Proud to be an American, making skits depicting war, or listing reasons why America was the greatest country in the world, chiefly its military. At high school and at community events, myself and other young teenagers were presented with an enticing image of what military service could offer us, financial benefits, community, and purpose. But as I learned through my own research and experience, there is far greater reason to oppose militarism and the military industrial complex that stands behind it. For one, Investing in war as deeply as the U.S. has robs us of so many opportunities to pursue a healthier, safer future. Changes in our climate and environmental destruction pose an ever-increasing threat to human health and safety. And the U.S. military is a leading contributor to the emerging crisis that is rarely addressed. According to a 2019 study, the military emits more greenhouse gases than 140 countries. The Blue Angels and shows like it serve as a recruiting tool and a flex of America's air power, which consistently is used to dis devastate civilians across the world, as recently as last weekend, when, an, when a drone strike in Afghanistan killed 10 civilians, including eight children. And because of the marriage between government and corporations, the United States foreign policy, including decisions to go to war, are dictated by economic interests. And corporations who profit from war are happy to risk military and civilian lives for profit. Imagine if we invested so much as a fraction of our swelling defense budget toward proactively mitigating the effects of climate change, such as water insecurity, as of 2014, there were 39,000 sites in the United States, including waterways, that were severely contaminated because of environmental disregard by the military. The military supposedly exists for our security, and yet the threat of a coming water crisis has been practically ignored. Climate scientists warn that as climate change worsens, drought and contamination will also worsen, even in areas that had seen an abundance in water. Water is the cornerstone of all life on Earth. So as water scarcity worsens, it will take the forefront of geopolitical issues. A couple years ago, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, confirmed this, placing the probability of future wars being waged over water at 95%. We need to invest in public water infrastructure so that corporations don't have their hand on the tap nor an excuse to drag us into another overseas war over water. While corporate media and mainstream environmentalism insist that the solution to climate change can be achieved through consumer choices and electing milquetoast reformers, the real culprits go without accountability. Imperialism is costly in all respects. It detracts from what could be invested in healthcare, education, and social services. It subjugates, traumatizes, exploits, and robs self-determination from people across the world. For little more than political utility and economic gain. Its drain on resources and massive pollution condemns future generations to a future of resource scarcity. We need to end the military-industrial complex and finally reconsider what it means to be a patriot. Thank you. Before our next speaker, we've got one more song from the Ideal Band.
amazing job. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Garrett Reppenhagen, an Iraq War veteran and executive director of Veterans for Peace. Hey, y'all. So, uh, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people that uh, have a... Uh, well, I don't... Hey, you can hear me now? Yeah, there's probably uh, some amazing speakers that uh, I don't want to repeat a lot what they said, but look, you know, I, I joined the U.S. Army one month before September 11th, and, uh, you know, I was, I was indoctrinated into the military for a long time. You know, I, my father's a Vietnam vet, retired Army. Uh, both my grandfather served in World War II. Um, you know, military service was a tradition in my family. But that's not why I joined. I joined because uh, I joined because there was an economic impact. I was working four minimum wage jobs, uh, struggling to make rent. I was a, a high school dropout after my dad passed away from Agent Orange-related cancer, and uh, you know, I was I was looking for an opportunity, and that's what the military is for a lot of people right now. But you know, more than an opportunity, there's this nationalistic uh, uh, support of the U.S. military. There's there's a blind uh, unwillingness to think critically about our government, to hold it accountable, and to make sure that they're sending troops into harm's way only after all diplomatic solutions are exhausted. And how we got that way is is through this this nationalistic ideal. You know, this this thing that the Blue Angels are flying over right now is this is this blind support. They're using taxpayer money to sell back to the public that war is good, right? And you know, it's. It's that blind uh, un unwillingness to be analytical and criticize our own leadership that gets us into this situation. And then that, that same nationalism makes it impossible to leave. If you walk through the halls of Congress, every single office has a POW MIA flag out front. And that is because they are, they are not supportive uh, just, just altruistically of, of service members and lost service members, but they're, they'd be ashamed not to do it because of the, Everybody else is judging them for not having it, you know? Like folks coming to this uh, Blue Angel show uh, this weekend, you know, is, is basically uh, just enraptured in the same nationalistic identity. And, and you know, the, the intersectional issues between climate, racism, and war couldn't be felt more. If you, if you look at the, uh, you know, the events of January 6th, uh, at, at the U.S. Capitol, that was spurred by nationalism. You know, this, this idea uh, around this uh, white supremic uh, identity uh, that is, you know, it's spurred on by this defensiveness of, uh, uh, you know, white reclamation. And it's, it's, it's drilled down. If you look deep down, it's still connected to this nationalism. It's all connected, to just like this Blue Angel show. The amount of fuel that's wasted just today to sell war back to us um, is making it more likely that there's going to be more war, more likely that we're going to send troops in harm's way, and it perpetuates this positive feedback loop that we're caught into, you know? So, you know, I just want to thank all the organizers, uh, you know, Lisa, Peace Action, VFP, all the other organizations involved to have the courage to step out here. Because at one point, it, it had to have taken some courage. Uh, to, to stand in front of all these vehicles that are coming to the show, this place where everybody wants to go, you know, uh, you know, support the troops because they're, you know, they don't want to be ashamed not to, you know, or, you know, they want to see the coolest, latest, you know, fighter jet or whatever it is that's spurning them. It takes courage to stand out here and speak truth to power. It always does, you know, and it's, it's these little sacrifices that we make that encourage everybody every day to take one more step forward. You know, I know there's a lot of people in this community that have gone out to Bath Ironworks and have been arrested and have protested there. You know, that takes an incredible amount of courage. But we, may, we have to make sure we're not doing this in vain. We have to build critical mass. And that's why it's important just to come out on a, on a Saturday morning and join us here on this corner. I'm new to Maine, and I'm going to be out here as, as often as I can whenever, whenever Lisa gives me the call, whenever Doug Rawlings gives me the call, whenever Bruce gives me the call, I'm going to... I'm going to bend over backwards to try to be here because one more person makes a difference every single time. You know, I, I didn't know how many people were going to be here today. I'm so impressed uh, by the folks that have showed up um, and your willingness to, to stand, stand here and, and face these folks and, and, and speak the truth. Because if, if more people did this, 
uh, before I, I joined, before I went to Iraq as a sniper, before I went to Kosovo, I would probably have never been on that route. You, you could have stopped me from doing that. So we need one more person every single time. So next time, invite a friend, make sure they come, give them a ride. Uh, and, and when you come out here, do it safely. Because another intersectional issue right now is, is this health crisis that's, that we're, we're facing. So that's another risk you took coming out here. But we can do it safely, we can show up safely, we can do it right. And I think, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody for doing that. And, uh, you know, keep, keep at it. And I'll, I'll be here, I, I, I'll make that promise to you. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you so much, Garrett. All right, our next speaker today is Tarek Koff, a Veterans for Peace member coming all the way from New York. So let's give, let's give him a hand. I'm really proud to be here and to stand with all you people from Maine and for wherever you came to be part of this. We may not be able to stop what's going on here which is the sexy side of the war machine. But there's another side to this war machine, and it's important that we stand and that we're not silent about it. The other side of the war machine is the part that has destroyed Afghanistan, that has destroyed Iraq, that has destroyed Syria and other places, that destroyed Vietnam. That's the other part. And when you talk about destroying these countries, you're talking about murdering and killing children and women and families and blowing them up with, with uh, planes like these blue angels are flying. That's the other side. That's the not sexy side of the US military. It's a side that, dis that is destroying people and it is most responsible for the climate destruction on our planet. If you want to know the one element that is destroying this planet, most destructive for the climate destruction of your planet, it is the U.S. military. I was a paratrooper in the U.S. military, and I'm not proud of it. I am not proud of the fact that I served in this U.S. military, because this is the military that is going to make the world unsafe, not only for Afghanistan children, not only for Iraqi children, but for your children, but for all children. And it's gonna make it a place that is unsustainable. Who do you think is behind all of this climate crisis? It is the US military, okay? So I don't know how much more to say. I'm irate, I thank us all for being out here, for not being silent, for standing with our signs. And a lot of credit to all of you. We may be in a minority, but we're standing for the truth, we're standing for peace, we're standing for justice, and we're standing for a more sustainable world, which those people, the US military, which is gonna be flying overhead with their, and have their tanks here that kids could climb up on, I've seen it. To, to, to the kids, this is heaven. You know, they get to stand on a armored vehicle with the machine guns, you know, and it, it seems like it's incredible. So this is what they're selling to our children, and it's horrible. But I thank you for being here. I thank all of us. We're in a minority, but we're standing up for truth, peace, justice, and the world. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Tarek. Our next speaker is Leslie Manning, Interfaith Minister. Good morning. At least it's a good morning for us here now because we aren't in the basements of New York. We're not on the runways of Afghanistan. We're not waiting for the knock at the door that will tell us that our loved one is no more in Palestine. We are the voices of the voiceless. And we stand in witness to the fact that 20 years and $21 trillion later, we haven't learned a damn thing, except how to kill more efficiently and how to squeeze more profit out of the American taxpayer. 
Anger is righteous, but anger will not carry us alone. Justice is crying out, and mercy will not carry us alone. As we stand today in witness to the power of love, compassion, peace, I'm going to ask you to do something as peacemakers that is very challenging. I'm going to ask you if you pray, to pray, if you meditate to reflect, and if you don't, to hold in your heart the war makers and the war mongers, the pimps and the panderers who believe that the destruction of life is a sacred thing. Let's hold them now in our hearts. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Thank you. All right, next up we've got another number from the Ideal Band. Thank you. All right, so our next and final speaker for today is George Stanley. You're wrapping it up. I, 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 they always let me in for the last word. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm trying to follow the program here. Uh, the wind whipped up in the Sea of Galilee and the boats turned over, yeah. The plane flipped in the sky. Yeah, hi, hey. Look, I'm almost in tears because it took me forever to get here and it's great to be here but my ancestry goes way, way, way back. It's starting right here in Brunswick, Maine. My ancestors were generals in all the wars, revolutionary on. My great-great-grandfather, nine times back, John Bush is buried between Sam Adams and Paul Revere in the Greenery Downtown Crossing Burial Yard. My ancestor right here and went to Bowdoin like General Joshua Chamberlain. He dropped out this freshman year to also become a general. They're buried side by side in the Maple Grove Cemetery on the back side of Bowdoin there. His name on this family plot marker, the big obelisk and all that, his name is uh, General Dr. Reverend George, like me, Crawford. He went back to Texas as a carpetbagger after the Civil War to open a bank that failed in one year because they didn't like his main accent. <laughs> and um, then he became a traveling Methodist circuit minister on horseback. And there's a, a brass plaque to his name there, too, for that. Uh, so, oh, another general ancestor was in World War of 1812 general. His son became a Quaker. Why? Because he got sick of hearing war stories around the supper table, huh? Maybe? Yeah, you think? Well, so anyway, my father was a pacifist in World War II and served in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, penitentiary. He served, in, in quote, served time you get it yeah then my uh, br older brother w went to prison under a 10-year sentence during vietnam as a co pacifist he wouldn't accept all, even alternative military du duty at the dartmouth hitchcock hospital he, they said either carry a bedpan or carry a rifle he said i'll have no part of either i mean that that's really like really far the far out at the outer edge there isn't it of, to resist that and when you're offered something like that conveniently as an escape route out the back door. No. Well, and I became CP, uh, conscience objector, not commanding officer, conscience objector, CO, uh, seminary student, and then finally minister. I got the green card saying 4F, not 4D. I know a lot of you are thinking 4D right here. No, no, no not that kind, Meshuggahnan, no, no. 4F, uh, minister's exemption, and that was, um, in the, I got it in the mail as the war was winding down, and I was 26. I gave up career, life, wife, children, the, the, the picket fence, the house in suburbia, the SUV. Gave it all up. Didn't have any of that. Still don't. Don't, don't need material. You know, Mary Beth and, and Bruce Gagden, my lovely, beautiful friends, know me from the Preble Street and working down there as a uh, one foot in the shelter and one foot out in the streets and trying to help. 
and do good in the world. And from here to Washington, D.C., that man there with his back to me knows me, the former mayor of Lewiston. We went to D.C. for five days at the Hyatt Regency. Not the Trump, no, not Trump in, no, no, no. We wouldn't have any part of that. And we, we met with all our senators and congressmen. Then we went, took it to the streets and, and took, went out and protested. I almost got arrested in the lobby of, uh, we hit, uh, there was Fannie Mae. We went in their lobby and uh, the other outfit there, they, they were gonna put the cuffs on me. But they looked down and saw my cane, my, my steel cane, they backed off. That's my only weapon and my mouth and my mind. You know, that's it, that's all I have. That's what I check in at the door at the courthouse where I just was here in West Bath uh, yesterday. Well, anyway, so to wrap it up and bring it to a closure, I am dying of cancer, stage four, incurable. They said, Dana Farber, go home and live your life. I'm 74 yesterday. I'm here to just say my final goodbyes. There's tears in my eyes. And, you know, I said my final goodbyes at that big climate march down in New York City a few years back, too, there. And uh, Al Gore, my old friend, was there. And Leo DiCaprio, yeah, yeah, you know, hey, whatever. And... Uh, <laughs> they, I said, I will never see any of you again. I said my final goodbyes. Well, the, the, the Japanese peace monks from the pagoda I helped build in, in uh, Amherst and Leverett, Mass, next, they were marching through Maine. They came up through here, and I got them to go back to Berlin, New Hampshire, the north route. They had never, ever been on that north route. I was on the phone for five days. I got them housing, miraculously. The churches donated money and food and everything, and uh, they came through that section back there in, in way up near Canada, Berlin, New Hampshire. And so I'm, I'm very proud to say, and they were all my old friends, uh, Kato and everybody that you, some of you all know, and... Uh, here we are. We're at the at the end, uh, or the, just the beginning, and we're phasing out. And I want to see the youth. Where's the youth here? We need more youth. We got too much of the hair color of the the gray head. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, he'll do. Okay. We pass on the yeah, the mantle, the mantle, and that's the cancer I have. Passing on the mantle, cell lymphoma, MCL, the mantle over your fireplace. Carry on, folks. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, George. All right, to close us out today, we're going to have the ideal band continue playing. Thank you. All right, huge thank you to the ideal band. It's always street worthy and street ready. Uh, <laughs> always ideal for the situation, that's right. All right, um, so. Thank you all so much for coming here today. I want to reiterate how much it means to me um, and how much how much of an impact this is having. We're here changing minds, changing hearts. Um, so before, we're going to have one quick announcement from Lisa and also we're going to have all the scheduled speakers come gather for a quick photo. Um, yep, thank you. Let's hear a big round of applause for our MC, Luke Secura Flanders. Was he amazing or what? Woohoo! Love that youth leadership. So I have a couple announcements. Actually, uh, the photographer, um, Ellen, uh, who came all the way from New York, would like us all to gather to get our picture taken. So if you're willing to come over and maybe put your mask up and get close or maybe not get too close for a group picture after I'm done here uh, at the microphone. That would be great. We're going to kind of gather right around here. The other announcement is Rosie invited us all to her backyard for lunch. Guess what? There's way too many of us for Rosie's backyard. A great problem to have. So I would like to invite everyone to instead bring your picnic or get some takeout if you didn't bring a picnic. And let's meet on the corner of the Bowdoin campus that is closest to Main Street. It's right on Main Street. And basically this road right here, the Bath Road, you just follow it back into Brunswick. You see the Bowdoin campus. Find Main Street, that's your cross street. And let's sit on the lawn and have some lunch together if you have time for that and you feel like doing it. One of the best things about these type of events is getting together with all you wonderful people, the conscience of your nation. Thank you for being here. Okay. So come on, to come get your picture taken. Bruce wants me to make a BIW announcement for the vigil every Wednesday at 11. That second and fourth Wednesdays at 11, there's a vigil. 
outside BIW in Bath, so uh, come on down. They have signs for you, and, um, and be ready for the next christening whenever that occurs, which could be a long time in these COVID times. So let's do a picture, everybody. Come on down. We're going to have to stick in, you know, a few rows behind the banners, and if we could get the VFP flags all in a row in the back, that would just be so cool, even though, of course, the wind is blowing them backwards. So, yeah, get in behind, squeeze on in, put on the grass. You have no idea how beautiful this is.
my sword and shield. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Gonna lay down my sword and shield. Down by the riverside. Ain't gonna study war no more.